Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second webinar of our 11 part series, which is entitled Pandemic Pangolins Systems, Science and Society. Last week, we had a really fantastic and engaging discussion with um, Imran Valodia and Daniela Casale um, on the relationship between economics, health and gender um, in the context of COVID-19. For any of you who might have missed this discussion, we did record it and we will be recording this one too. Um, and we are uploading them onto our website, which is vitswhere2.org. It's vits-where2.org. Um, the purpose of the website is really intended as a learning repository for many of our students, um, where we can showcase some of the key publications of each week's speakers. Um, and I encourage you all to please uh, check out the website for more information about our speakers. Just as a quick introduction, my name is Stephen Pence. I am a lecturer in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care. I coordinate um, a, an innovative health systems course that is offered to Bachelor of Health Science students in our faculty. And this program has foundations in basic sciences, anatomy and physiology with majors in public health and health system sciences. And the hope here is that um, we are producing health system scientists for the future who can address many of the challenges that we will hear about today. I believe that there are a number of students who have joined us from our first to third years of the course. So the topic for this week is the backbone of COVID, focusing particularly on primary health care. And I would like to welcome our two speakers who are both fits based Dr. Juliet Nyasulu, who is a public health specialist from the Community Pediatrics Unit. Um, welcome to the call, Juliet. Thank you. And of course, uh, Prof. Richard Cook, who is a family physician and is head of the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care. Thank you for joining us again, Richard. Um, so, um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, on the call, we have one of the key authors from the publication that Juliet is going to talk to, Dr. Himani, Himani Pandya, who is joining us all the way from India. So you're very welcome, Himani. Thank you. In terms, in terms of logistics, um, how this session works is that we will have 10 minutes for each speaker. Um, and uh, following which I'll take liberties in prompting a discussion between the two speakers and I will invite comments from the floor. Please feel free to post your thoughts and questions on the Q&A tab which will appear um, at the bottom of your screen. So without any further ado, let me hand over to Juliet as our first speaker. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, good Good afternoon, colleagues, afternoon viewers uh, from wherever you are. Um, we, we will be, uh, in this session, we'll be talking to uh, a publication that uh, myself and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pandya, who is also on the session, uh, wrote. And this publication is actually focusing on how we can strengthen health systems uh, to be able to maintain the essential health services during pandemics, like uh, in this case, we are looking at the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So maybe before, and, and in this publication, we are also proposing um, an, an approach or a framework that can be used to, you know, to identify the risks the, uh, the pandemic is posing on the essential health services uh, delivery, as well as uh, possible solutions uh, that can be done to ensure that there is a balance between um, uh, containing the pandemic and uh, uh, delivery of the essential health services. So, um, Firstly, maybe before we go any further, it's important that we define uh, the, a, a resilient health system. So in this case, since we're talking about the primary health care, we are looking at what is a resilient uh, primary health care in the context of a pandemic as we have the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll define it as um, a health system that is able to contain the uh, the pandemic, and at the same time, be able to maintain its core functioning purposes of delivering the essential health services. And when we're talking of these essential health 
aid services, uh, according to the South African public uh, uh, primary health care, you're looking at um, the common maternal and child health services, you, child health services, which include growth monitoring, EPI, and then um, the, uh, the reproductive health services, which include antenatal care, labor and delivery, postnatal care, and screening of the different cancers, the breast, uh, cervical and prostate cancers, and also not forgetting the management of the uh, minor il illnesses and the chronic disease. You're talking of the hypertensive cases and HIV, diabetes. So you can see that uh, the primary health care is the backbone of the health system. That's the entry point for the health system. And it is very critical um, that uh, such services are maintained even during a uh, pandemic, because you can see what happened um, during the Ebola pandemic, that uh, after the Ebola pandemic, there was an upsurge of morbidity and mortality due to preventable and uh, treatable diseases, just because the health system was not able to contain the pandemic and strike a balance and continue, you know, um, uh, delivering the essential health services. So, why does this happen? How how could it happen that the essential health services uh, could lag behind? So you can see in the context of COVID nineteen. Uh, it had called on uh, upon a lot of resources. I know Prof. Cook will be talking to us on how they mobilized the resources and the resources that went into preparation of uh, the emergency response to COVID-19 pandemic. So it requires a lot of resources. Uh, it required, um, it also negatively affected the health-seeking behavior because people were looking at the clinics as high-risk areas according to how they are defined. So they would rather not go get COVID and not get vaccinated or not go pick up their medication. So you can see how the essential health services were negative, uh, being negatively affected because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in our pu publication, we've got two key thoughts. You know, the first one is uh, putting across the message on the ability of the services um, in seamlessly uh, ensuring that they're able to contain the pandemic and navigate through the process and at the same time ensure that they are maintaining the essential health services, you know, to, to prevent the repercussions which I've already uh, uh, alluded to. And secondly, the other thought is that uh, we are um, advocating for close collaboration between the emergency response team and, uh, and the team that is delivering the essential health services. Because as, I'm talk as I was talking to resources, um, it is key that resources are maximized. And if there is that integration, it would really, um, you know, you can maximize resources. At the same time, um, you know, COVID, you know, the, the pandemic, the emergency pandemic, you know, sometimes comes to stay. For example, COVID, we thought it would be one month, two months, three months, but now we are talking of half a year, seven, seven months, we are dealing with the, the, the pandemic. So how do we integrate this? Because it can't always be an emergency. How do we integrate it into the essential uh, services? And the, that would only be done if there is close collaboration uh, between the emergency team and the ones who are uh, delivering the essential services. So uh, through our publication, we are proposing a framework that was adopted from the WHO Health System Strengthening Framework. And this framework, um, uh, mainly with focus on the uh, building blocks. So using the framework, you can be able to ask questions on, uh, on how to identify the risks that the pandemic is posing on delivery of essential health services, and also identify the possible uh, solutions that can be done to ensure that the health system, especially in this context, the primary health system, is able to, uh, to strike a balance and continue the core business of delivering the essential health services. And if I can ask you, Stephen, please, can you pitch up the framework so that maybe I can talk to the framework? Okay, um, thank you very much. So as, as, as you can see, this is uh, just a simple framework. And what I can say is that uh, this 
is a rapid assessment tool. It's a tool that can be used at uh, any level to assess, to quickly assess how the pandemic it now in this context, the COVID-19 pandemic is, um, is affecting the services. And for example, uh, you can look at um, uh, the, on my far left is, uh, is the, the six building blocks of uh, the health, uh, WHO health system fr framework. And these are service delivery, health workforce, information systems, essential suppliers, health financing, leadership and governance. And those of us who are familiar with these blocks, you can see that these blocks rely on each other. If one block is not working, it paralyzes the other block. So it's very important that when you are doing this rapid assessment, you don't just focus on one block because if the other block is left behind, it will negatively affect the performance of the other block. For example, if, um, uh, if the essential supplies are there, but the health workforce is not there, then who will deliver those essential supplies? You know? So it's very key to look at it as a whole, as all the six building blocks. And in this rapid assessment, you, uh, you, uh, at, at baseline, uh, we are proposing that you should ask these difficult questions. Like for example, what are the existing gaps and strengths in the essential health services? So this framework is not one size fits all. You know, it can be adapted depending on um, the, the situation or the level at which it is being used. So, um, for example, not all services may be uh, affected. You realize that uh, maybe in a facility, uh, for example, I mentioned of different essential services, maybe family, family planning, people are no longer coming to family planning, whilst uh, cervical screening, they're still coming for that then it means that you will focus, you will red, you will red flag that, uh, uh, that essential service that is the one that is lagging behind in that specific uh, facility. So you can, you can also ask questions like, which are the worst performing provinces, districts or facilities, depending on at which level you are using that framework. If you are using that district level or sub-district level, you are looking at which facilities are having are being most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and how, yeah? What are the emergency responses? And um, you also look at what will the responses, how will these responses affect the health system's delivery essential services? So if you can uh, respond to, if one can respond to such uh, questions at the beginning, you can be able to, you know, to pick up uh, the, these risks and then um, look at how the, you can plan to implement uh, so possible solutions that can assist or that can, um, uh, ca 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 can address the gaps that have been identified as you are doing your assessment. So for example, you know, we have just outlined a few questions here. You can look at which essential services need to be prioritized postponed and suspended? That's a very difficult question. Because in an emergency, when you are containing the pandemic, you may not be able to deliver all the services, but you need to look at how do you prioritize, you know? Like for example, uh, would, you, would you postpone uh, immunizations? No, because later on you'll be having children sick from preventable diseases. But for example, uh, male medical circumcision, it can be postponed. I think that was one of the recommendations uh, by WHO to say we can postpone male medical uh, circumcision. So it's very important to, uh, to, you know, to apply such a framework to be able to identify the risks and possible solutions so that you, the health system can be able to strike the balance between containing the pandemic and, um, and, um, and, uh, and, and continuing the essential services. So for the sake of time, I'll finish here and know that we'll go into further discussions in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juliet. Um, I think this framework will be very familiar to many of our students. And we often talk about the integration between all the different component parts as an important thing to consider. Um, so thank you for raising that issue. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Professor Cook to share some of his experiences um, in setting up, managing and dismantling the Nazrik Co um, Field Hospital. Over to you, Richard. Stephen, thank you very much. And, and, uh, and I'm delighted to be part of this 
this particular uh, webinar series and thanks to uh, the team within my department for putting it all together. Um, yes, I, I would like to, to follow on from a number of, of uh, Juliet's uh, very, very key inputs with regards to the integration of essential services and, the, and an emergency response. Um, what I'd like to be doing though is speaking directly to our experience of preparedness of our PHC facilities uh, for the COVID-19, as a COVID-19 response, as an emergency response uh, within the Joburg Health Metro District specifically. And indeed going then on to some of our experiences of setting up the intermediate care section at the NASREC quarantine and isolation uh, facility or field hospital. Um, I'm going to be speaking to three um, particular components. One, uh, just to give you the facts, um, as, in, as in what did we do? And secondly, um, to speak uh, to the, uh, the focus in terms of our specific, a couple of points that I'd just like to raise um, apropos the, the, um, some key lessons learned that we, that, we, that we have been able to take forward or we hope to. And then lastly, just the flip side facts, um, focus, and flip side, and that there are always balances to be made in the decision-making. And uh, what were some of those key, uh, key uh, uh, dilemmas that we came across, decisions that we needed to be making um, uh, that in, in, our, in our journey so far? So very quickly, I just first wanted to take you through um, a, something of a, of a collage of, uh, of photographs, just to give you a sense as to what the, the context is that I'm speaking to. Stephen, could you just um, confirm that you could see this, please? Yes, that's showing on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm going to go through um, and um, just to, to give you some context. First of all, we did start at these primary care facilities. Um, the 109 um, primary health care facilities of the 126 odd facilities in total within the Johannesburg Metro um, and it was really one, one, one particular system that we were looking to replicate across all those 109 facilities. Joburg Metro being split into seven different sub-districts and uh, we led with a family physician lead within the um, Department of Family Medicine, but also with a number of, of other key parties in, uh, in, in that regard. Whereas the NASREC um, um, hospital is, as along the lines of the health system sciences thinking, that was more one facility within which we had multiple systems. But of course it was a facility in itself that was part of a broader health system. And I'd like to be speaking to this. So um, first of all, just a note from, from with Juliet's comment around the integration of the two services, we recognized that we need to prepare these facilities really along four specific, with its four specific goals in mind. We need to protect patients, we need to protect healthcare workers. We need to allow health facilities to continue to deliver their health facilities, uh, health services. And we need to facilitate the care and treatment or the diagnosis care and treatment of COVID-19 patients and then refer on appropriately. And so if we look at one particular area that we needed to set up within the, the, um, the, the facility context, there were in fact, essentially three different areas. To go back two slides, we've got the yellow, orange, and blue. Blue was the replication of the services, essentially not, beg your pardon, not replication, the continuation of services for those patients that were deemed to be low risk for not presenting with symptoms, whereas the yellow zone is where we, where we, where we are ascertaining that risk into which the patients would then, if they were symptomatic, go into the orange zone, but then into the blue zone if they were asymptomatic. Not the best way of, of not an optimal situation or not a perfect situation, should I say, on account of, as we well know, the pre-symptomatic patients in particular may well be infected um, the, and, and therefore infectious, but nevertheless, we split them into these three zones. Um, so with regards, the, the, that's where we try to replicate or continue the services in the blue zone, but then, these were what we needed to do within that orange zone. We wanted to provide, to, to, to look at COVID-19 in itself for those who are, because these are all symptomatic patients, assess the severity and the need for emergency department or referral, 
counsel on the home isolation and, and education around that, but then look to HIV in particular, look to still continue an HIV test, provide that or collect TB sputum and the like and investigate, do the TB screening within that context. So essentially try to replicate the services there or call as per number five, call the individuals from the clinic setting out to replicate the service for that symptomatic patient. So not an entirely um, efficient system for needing to replicate around, uh, but nevertheless optimal, on, at least on paper, with regards trying to continue the services that we were normally providing. So let me now just go through some slides and I'm, I'm not gonna comment. I just want to go through some photographs to give you a sense as to what we're talking about very briefly here in the PHC setting and indeed in the NASREC facility. The yellow, the yellow station, the yellow screening zone, and this is the orange zone in which we had with, uh, with the great help of ANOVA and others able to replicate the services. So that's a sense of the PHC facilities. And then this is the NASREC facility that I'm gonna be speaking to in that these halls to this. Okay, so um, that just gives you a sense, a quick, quick collage of photographs, but I'd like to be speaking to, to some of the issues that we, that uh, some of the lessons learned. And, and so we had, we, to give you a couple more facts, we, the, in those 109, um, uh, for those 109 facilities, um, the question is then, were we successful? And um, in terms of treating the COVID-19 patients, protecting those who weren't, um, COVID-19, continuing the services through this, both an integrated model and segregation of services or symptomatic and asymptomatic patients as best we, we could. Um, I'm reminded of the PEPFAR um, presentation a couple of days ago for those facilities looking at City of Johannesburg in particular, where they were reflecting on quarter two versus quarter three, remembering that 50% of the cases in Gauteng were in City of Joburg, or in the Joburg Metro. And indeed, what we found is that there was a 24, they found in their data that there was a 24% reduction in the, in the primary healthcare headcount. There was a 6.4% reduction in the, those on, on current ARV treatment between quarter two and quarter three, that specifically. And indeed, there was a 48% a of the facilities within the, within the, the, the city of Johannesburg facilities 48% of them were closed um, in July for greater than one day. So I, I leave you to judge. I mean, those are, 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 are not, certainly that the COVID-19 has significantly impacted the services um, as, as, as Juliet has, has implied. Um, in the NASREC facility, what we did is we, we, we spent, well, we spent May and essentially April, May and June within the PHC primary healthcare preparedness setting. And we replicated that system that I've just described over 109 facilities. We then turned our attention to NASREC once that had been set up and we added the, the intermediate care facility to the existing quarantine and isolation facility. The, the latter was opened in, in uh, early June and there they saw 618 patients between early June and to the beginning of September, essentially. In the intermediate care setting, we saw 103 or admitted 103 patients to that particular setting. Again, with our first patient, which was a month later, essentially, than quarantine and isolation to the beginning of September. Then, so we, 
I've said something. So to move from facts of the matter as I've had outlined it to some of our foci and some of our key lessons. And I've mentioned something around service delivery. Did we manage to integrate the existing services or the emergency response with the existing? We, the, we, we need to look at this more closely in terms of how indeed, how successful we were. And I'm mindful of, of the, 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 um, the, the, the challenges that, that we, we now face in keeping, what, what do we need to keep maintaining with regards to the PHC facilities? Or, and what, what do we need to tweak and, and, and change? We have to um, look to the lessons learned from this and see in this window of opportunity what we can now improve before, before potentially a wave two comes about. So, but, but remaining, looking specifically, if I may, at HR, because really that's a key service, that's a key building block. And really that for me is where it's, where it's all at in that we would really focus on the closure, on the safety of staff within the PHC facility, but then we were seeing a lot of closures. And that does speak to the interaction between leadership and governance as well, and were we giving the, the correct messages or not. Um, and in addition, I, I, I must focus on the fact that from a, from a leadership and governance perspective, we were focusing, there were a lot of volunteers, and I want to raise this from the, in the NASREC context. There were a lot of volunteers that came on board to get this going, myself included, as a WITS employed staff member. So therefore, in the DOH context, I, I am essentially a volunteer. And that, that governance between the volunteer driving this project, but the Department of Health and coming on board and us needing to collaborate in this regard is another key point that Juliet and Amani were also raising in their paper. Did that work successfully? I think so. But there were, certainly we can take some lessons from that. Just with regards to my last comment, my last area, and that's the flip side. Um, first of all, we recognize, and I'd like to focus on NASREC with two, two um, quick comments, if I, if I may. And that is that when we set up this facility, it was standalone in itself, but it had to fit within the healthcare system. And we very quickly real, realized that that was critical. That vehicle that you saw in the photographs was actually privately funded through SPIRE, or SPIRE is an administ it's a science for the South African um, um, pandemic uh, response effort. Um, the, the intervention and response effort is the SPIRE acronym, working with, with solidarity funds. And they provided that for us so we could just be agile in referring patients back and forth. We needed to look in the Nazareth context within our, in our admissions as to the seriousness of the patients, which was quite low that we could admit, because remember this is a stand down or a, a, um, a, stand, a step down facility, whereby we were essentially taking patients who were, who were on the mend, but still needed to be on oxygen still needed to have prophylactic or uh, well, thromboprophylaxis, diabetes management um, and the like. And we were, we were needing to balance then, certainly we didn't want to have uncertainty in terms of their care, but we managed to increase the amount of seriousness. Okay. And lastly, um, just to make in terms of health systems thinking, we needed to grapple with the fact that this wasn't just completing the care as in step down and then completing but rather it was preparing our patients for home. In the COVID-19 response, this was critical because our diabetes management, for example, and preparing our families through engaging in video calls, through engaging in education with our, of the families while the patient was still with us was critical. Let me pause there, Stephen. Thank you, Thank you. for that. Um, and we've got a number of questions that have already come through in response to some of the things that you've mentioned. Um, and while you've both been talking, I'd just be jotting down a few keywords, words such as integration, collaboration, sustainability, um, trying to prevent the verticalization of services. Um, and if for those of us who know the WHO framework, um, we have these six key building blocks that have to work in relation with each other. And the purpose is to, to work towards improved health outcomes and uh, health systems responsiveness. But there's something in between, which is around access and coverage, quality, and very importantly, around safety. 
and one of the big issues I think that emerged um, in terms of people's experiences or perceptions of COVID was the question of safety, both for providers and for um, users of the health service. Um, so I was wondering whether you could perhaps, um, both of you could perhaps share your views on this, this aspect of the framework, bearing in mind that we know all frameworks have their own limitations, um, but really considering some of these kind of uh, essential aspects that um, it allow those framework, those uh, building blocks to work together to achieve its um, ultimate outcomes. Any thoughts on that? So shall I, uh, would you like me to go first? Can I make a comment, yeah. Stephen? Are you happy? Yeah. Um, you so I, I, I do think that, that two things I'd like to speak to. One is, what is the glue that, that really integrates all the, the, the building blocks um, that, that Juliet so eloquently spoke to? And for me, it's really um, human resources and the, 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 the people doing the work. And it takes a crisis to, to, to uh, remind us that it's those who are on the ground be they clinicians or otherwise, but generally they are clinicians, um, but certainly also are, are public health specialists and the like um, that are that are the critical um, voice in this. And I and I think that that needs to be to be emphasised. And really, positive affirmation, appreciative inquiry, and the like are, are approaches that we should be taking towards dealing with our challenges through an HR lens. Secondly, though, just from a safety perspective. For our staff and and um, and our and all the parties involved, I'm reminded of how we we moved from identifying in the COVID-19 context low risk and high risk areas um, to one of just appropriate mindset and PPE, irrespective of the the context in which you you are working. And this is really a, 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 a evolution of our thinking as the as the evolution continued. And I've, I'm speaking specifically around both our, the, the volunteer program of our students and that we had at WITS, we had 450 students who worked to volunteer, not all within these two projects, but certainly a number within the PHC setting. And, um, and the great majority of those who were infected, not within only our program, but across all the programs, uh, it's, it's linked to community transmission, not clinical environment. And that's food for thought. Thank you. Okay, C can I can I add on? Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks so much. Uh, just to add on uh, what uh, Prof. Cook has uh, mentioned, you know, in terms of fa uh, safety uh, during this COVID um, nineteen pandemic, we are looking at uh, it's not just about the service users. We are also looking at the service providers. So, for example, using that framework you can see how um, the COVID-19 pandemic is the negatively affecting the, putting the health service providers at risk of uh, contracting the disease, leading to depletion of uh, service providers. And uh, if you look at the framework, for example, where we are proposing on uh, how to, the, the health service providers, they need to be capacitated. They need to be properly trained on how to prevent or to protect themselves from contracting the disease. In addition to that, they also need to, um, uh, to they, they also need supposed to be some, uh, you know, systems put in place. For example, screening. They need to be screened to make sure that the one who is uh, infected is properly isolated and is not able to spread to other, uh, uh, you know, service providers. As you can see that we have had challenges in South Africa where uh, other hospitals like 40 service providers would be diagnosed in a day and leading to closure of the whole facility. So it was important that uh, there is an ongoing screening process so that uh, those who are infected can be isolated and those who, um, who and, 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 and then th those who, who are not infected can, can, can be able to know as to when and how to, you know, to, to seek help. At the same time, we're looking at the, you know, the client aspect, the, the patients, the clients, the population, you know. Uh, if you are looking, uh, when we advertise or we rate the risk, actually they say home is green, okay? 
a shopping mall is yellow, but a clinic is red. That's how it is rated. So when you're looking at a clinic is red, meaning that if you go to the clinic or you go to any hospital or clinic, it means that you're at a higher risk of getting uh, you know, the, 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 the infection. And that has greatly negatively affected the health-seeking behavior for the population. That's why people are not coming for immunization because they would rather not immunize or not come to collect their medication so that they can be protected from getting you know, the, the, the infection because it is red, the clinic is red. So how do we navigate through that? In our framework, you know, if, if you look at it, that, we, we are proposing you know, building the trust in the population. How does the health system build the trust in the population that it is safe to come to the clinic? You will not get the, uh, the infection, you will still be protected. You know, there's need for, you know, social mobilization, sensitization. And in addition to that, the, you know, uh, uh, everyone coming to the clinic, it will lead to overcrowding and, you know, the issues of physical distance. It will be a challenge. Why can't we think of taking the services to the community? So, for example, if you never had a mobile immunization clinic, why don't we think about having those mobile immunization clinics so that people are receiving their for their services, these essential services in the community, not coming to the clinic. You know, so those are some of the, you know, the, the, the options that we are offering uh, through the framework that we're presenting this publication. Thank you. Thanks for that response. Um, in fact, this mirrors one of the points that uh, have been raised in the discussion. Um, we know that uh, one of the limitations of the WHO framework is that um, in the context of primary healthcare, where we prioritize patient centeredness or um, community engagement, um, in some ways, the language of, of uh, health frameworks tend to uh, have a more kind of business-like or external, uh, external from communities or the experiences of people in communities. Um, and a question specifically to you, Juliet, is that around uh, prioritizing decision making, who should get to decide how to prioritize? For example, could we have used community health workers and nurses to offer home vaccinations and vaccinations at the point uh, at different points of care, for example, through post office or libraries um, or spaces, other community spaces that might have been more appropriate, along with COVID-19 testing? Do you have any thoughts around that? Okay, um, I think um, you are correct that uh, we are talking of being people centered. We have to be centered around people. So um, regarding the, the, the framework, you, you, you are looking at, uh, I had already alluded to why don't we think uh, of, uh, you, know, you know, promoting mobile clinics so that we find the people there. And in addition to that, you know, in South Africa, we do have uh, systems or structures in place which have worked before. For example, the chronic medication program, whereby um, uh, people don't come to the clinic, but they collect, uh, you know, their chronic medication uh, from maybe the pharmacist nearby their place or some dispensing machines. So. Those are some of the, you know, the, less, the, the best practices that we already have. Then why don't we maximize that in such you know, circumstances so that at least instead of people coming to the clinic, they should be able to be saved in their community. You know, they can collect their medication. They can, apart from when they need to consult, that's when they would only come to the clinic. And we have already, we have been using this for HIV services, any chronic, um, you know, conditions. Um, so it, it works. So this is the opportunity to maximize these innovations and be able to, you know, to reach the people who are, who are the targets for our essential um, health services. Thanks. Um, thanks. And uh, Richard, um, I know that uh, we, when you were talking, you spoke uh, particularly around the partnership between public and private enterprises. And a question that's come through is, in times of crisis, we managed to work better with the private sector. Can we do this again and into the future and to have more win-win scenarios between the public and private sectors? 
What do we learn from your experiences of setting up, managing, and dismantling the Nazareth Field Hospital? I, I'm uh, I'm reminded of a of a um, perhaps a single word here that I'd want to want to be putting on the table here is is humility. In that looking at this from a from a, a humane perspective and as a as a as a system within which we're all working together um, when we set up the volunteer the, the, the intermediate care section within the within the the Nazarek setting um, there was there needed to be a whole lot of 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 humility with respect to our engagement and collaboration I can't really speak in the context of the private sector coming on board there except for the for the individuals who were working within that context as volunteers. But I say humility because we were coming into a Department of Health space and um, as a group of volunteers wanting to set this up. And there was a, a humility required to recognizing the work that had been done to date and the collaboration that we then needed to, to have with our, essentially our principals who were the Department of Health. And secondly, there was a humility on the Department of Health side to recognize the, the energy, the drive, the, the, the enthusiasm of the different parties to be coming on board to, to assist. And in this regard, I mean, this is a good time for, to me, for, for me to acknowledge, I mean, the likes of, of, of Lynn Wilkinson and Tom Boyles on, on the one side, who public health specialist and, and ID specialist respectively, who came on as volunteers essentially to this process. Secondly, um, Viz Naidu, who is the, the manager of the facility or the CEO of NASREC as the Department of Health. And then of course, um, Jimmy Aki, who is the family medicine, is the family medicine district head and, and his team also Department of Health and us all needing to work together. And it, perhaps it does take a crisis to, to recognize that how much we can get out of doing so. Um, it was, you know, we took a lot of lessons from, from the work and the, from the experience of the of the um, the Hospital of Hope in Cape Town and 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 the work that was being done there, um, in a very different scenario, really, in terms of a what services we being provided, and b in terms of the public and and uh, well the DOH driven process, and they weren't really the volunteers as I understood it, but I I could be wrong. But we took a lot of lessons there as well, from from the importance of having learning engagements on a regular basis, also so that we can build each other up. They had this context of a of a uh, this concept of a of a huddle, with people coming together as a huddle of parties. Again, that's just about affirming everybody's status, everybody's role, and building everybody up on a daily basis before we would they would engage in in the work to be done for the day, which is on a micro level, uh, another reflection of the humility and that we and recognition of everybody's contribution as in the in the broader whole. Is Juliet, your thoughts? Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, just to add on uh, what Richard has said, um, talking to the uh, human, uh, we're looking at uh, human, work, uh, human workforce uh, framework of the, the, the building block. Um, if you follow the story clearly, as when the, the, what the, the COVID-19 came into being, you know, at the time the president was making announcements around uh, measures to take, etc. One of the main and key directive was that uh, the PEPFA partners must be must prioritize the COVID-19 response. So, meaning that uh, because, like in South Africa, every district has got a PEPFA partner. So each partner took lead, like supporting the Department of Health, because there was a realization that there isn't enough capacity in the Department of Health. As a result, we needed an extra pair or an extra hand. And there's been an enormous support from the private partner. And, the, and it, it has really shown and reflected. And all the projects that uh, uh, Prof. Cook is talking about, it's all around partnership from, from the private sector, not from the, not solely, uh, you know, led or run by the Department of Health. And that has really shown to, to work. And at the same time, I also, uh, I would also, also to acknowledge that the same partners are uh, the whistleblowers. I remember 
uh, after we after we are in the pandemic, maybe two three months into the pandemic, um, there was a, a what a, 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 a what um, a report in one of the papers uh, that right to care is the, the the blew a whistle that people are not coming for the HIV uh, you know positive individuals are not coming to collect their medication. It, there was a decline. I think they were talking of tens of thousands of people missing their, you know, their medication. So you can see that in partnership, uh, there is like a, that, there's an aspect of supporting the actual service delivery, but at the same time, partners can also be whistleblowers to, you know, to alert the gaps, the key gaps, so that uh, there can be a response to address that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, this resonates with some of the points that were raised in the discussion last week too, that um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, what it has revealed are in many instances, some of the inherent fault lines that we experience within our own societies. Um, and many of these are more pronounced in South Africa given, given our turbulent history of dispossession. Um, and um, essentially, what, one of the aspects that you, you're stressing here is the importance of resilience within our health systems. This is how you started your, your um, presentation um, and how that resilience is necessary to mitigate against um, structural inequality. Um, and there's a question from the floor around the consequences of not considering all these different building blocks from the onset of the pandemic. And perhaps we can think about this question in relation to how um, uh, particular groups or vulnerable groups might have, their, uh, might have, their experiences might have been ex exacerbated by this crisis. Do you have any thoughts on that uh, particularly? Um, Dr. Dr. Pandya, are you there? Maybe Dr. Pandya can take this question. Yes, sure, please go ahead. Okay, thank, thanks for that question. Um, I think uh, this framework mostly, um, it's like, as Juliet mentioned, it's a rapid assessment tool for the health system and the health uh, managers to be more prepared, as we have seen uh, our experiences from the previous pandemics, such as the Ebola or the SARS pandemics, wherein um, the health system was not as prepared as it should be. And we never expected on the first go that we will have a situation like COVID that will cripple the whole health system across the world. So this framework kind of just gives, um, it's an aid to the people who are running the system to prepare themselves a little bit better, um, you know, foreseeing what's coming up and, and striking a balance. Um, I won't say that there is no harm if you don't use this framework, but I think using this framework gives our health managers, our health workers, our, our policymakers a bit more confidence of what do we currently have in hand and where are we lacking? So that the response that they initiate is not just, you know, uh, thumb sucking or just, um, it's not unplanned so that in the long run, they can plan their responses better and they can, um, they can learn to live with the pandemic in the longer run rather than just creating it a short term emergency, as Juliet mentioned. So yes, um, you can do without the framework, but if you use the framework, it will definitely be a huge help in terms of preparation for such uh, emergency situations. Thank you. Richard, would you like to add? Yeah, I must, if I may. And um, I mean, um, we, we, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Hermione and Juliet because really, a, a framework is a plan. It, it's a structure within which to, or at least a structure within which to formulate a plan. And again, who are we to 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 not plan? And who are we to think that there is a that uh, it's going to evolve because we're competent to do it, or because we need a structure, we need a framework? And what I appreciated about um, the paper that Hermani and Juliet wrote is that they also gave some concrete examples against each of the building blocks that people can look at and, and, and consider. Take health information, for example. One of the key things as a building block, one of the key things that we were struggling with is that we don't in Johannesburg Metro 
nor in Gauteng as a whole, have a decent um, system whereby um, information is provided around um, bed occupancy, one facility to another. And we, we don't want to be reporting information to simply for the sake of reporting. We want to report to run, as in run systems, and we want to report to improve systems. And, and that's what, what I picked up from, from Juliet and Amani's paper was that there is, we are looking to, him, to, 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 to this framework to plan and to improve from a quality improvement perspective. Um, in our prior discussion before we, uh, we start the, um, the recording, uh, Juliet actually mentioned this specifically around uh, health information systems. And she was saying that um, uh, what, who are considered essential human resources in the health system? Um, and one of the oversights were that data collectors who are responsible for collating all of this information were not considered essential um, service providers. And so there were lags, in fact, um, in the delivery of, uh, of, of health information across the health system as a consequence. It was hard for people to be, for services to respond and for policy and uh, planners to respond as a consequence. There's a question um, that is coming from, from, from Wilson in Zambia that uh, also resonates with what Juliet has been talking about. He says, my question goes to Dr. Juliet. In Zambia, we have seen an increase in the number of HIV patients not adhering to ART treatment or not visiting their health facilities during drug pickups for fear of contracting COVID-19 and for fear of subjecting them to COVID-19 tests. And also people have, perceive health facilities as high risk spaces. Um, perhaps uh, you could respond to how, how do we think or how do we address these kinds of fears or, or shift people's help seeking behavior with this, with this context, which I think is quite universally experienced. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, the question. And um, I think I've already alluded to this aspect because indeed it is true, it's not just in Zambia. It's actually across the globe that uh, there's a lesser uptake of the essential services, including chronic medication, and that includes the HIV uh, treatment. So how do we make sure that uh, these patients still access the services, still collect their medication? The first thing is the trust, because they are not coming just because the, the clinic is classified as red. What is happening in the facilities to reassure the patients that they will be protected when they are in the clinic? So we need to do the right things in the facilities to make sure that the patients are reassured of their protection and their safety. And at the same time, we also need to communicate to the like social mobilization, social sensitization, uh, to make sure that the public, the population, is aware that it's okay to come to the clinic. It doesn't mean that if you come to the clinic, you get the COVID. We will still protect you from getting the. It's not that all oh, health service providers are at risk. I remember uh, there was a time when in Malawi they were even stigmatizing health service providers. So if you are in uniform and you go into a public transport, people would refuse to say, we don't want you because you are high risk, you know? So they need to be proper sensitization that, uh, that people, health service providers are also protected. They are also not, uh, they, they, they will not be like, you will not be getting, you know, the, the COVID by coming to see a health service provider or by coming to the clinic, putting those systems in place, doing the sensitization, and as, as, as I mentioned, look at alternative innovations of taking the services to the community, like the community, the CSMDD program that is here in South Africa. I know it's, it's, it's actually across Sub-Saharan Africa. I know Zambia should also be, you know, implementing the, the chronic medication program where people collect medication outside the clinic. So all those are the options which can be put in place. But as I earlier indicated, this framework is not one size fits all. 
you look at it and see what is applicable to you and what is feasible because it all depends on available resources, feasibility, et cetera, to be able to, you know, to respond to the identified gaps. Yeah, I think that's what I can say. Thank you so much. Yeah, indeed. And in fact, there's a comment that has come through from the Western Cape, which uh, mirrors the same sort of sentiment um, from Herman. He says, in our context, the Western Cape uh, rural area, it was not just fear of people on chronic medication that service users did not get routine services, but that the whole health system was contracted, um, not making these services as available as regular as they were regularly. Um, so I guess it's a question around access and availability of services um, when resources are directed away from essential health services. And this draws, I guess, us, us to, the, to a discussion around uh, sustain, sustainability um, in the face of COVID um, living with us for, uh, into the, the near future um, and how we integrate our services um, across all levels of care, but particularly uh, maintaining primary health care services. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, uh, Prof. Cook? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I, I think, um, I think the the on reflection of our efforts within the um, within the Johannesburg Metro over the last couple of months uh, um, on these two projects. Um, I think it was, to be frank, it was uh, one of the lessons learned or um, one of the ways in which we could have done better is to coordinate the community level activities with the facility based ones. I'm not sure that we, we, for example, again, I mean, to reflect on our lessons that or our, our colleagues in Cape Town, I mean, they had quite a strong um, community engagement or community strategy around um, Around the 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 work that we're the the, the and and the linking um, the linking of services and the access issues. Not that we that we we haven't done it um, to to some extent here as well, but just in terms of the integration of the approaches of a facility based under and a community led drive. Um, and the other point to make is that you know in many instances we didn't we 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 were happy for people not to come to the facility. Um, and so the PHC, the reduction in PHC headcount, um, we, we weren't necessarily looking to get the normal numbers because if we could reclassify a patient as, as a blue patient for being asymptomatic in two weeks' time, uh, after 14 days or 10 days later, that would be, and they came back to the clinic to, without any undue um, disadvantage to them with, in terms of accessing the service and their care, then we would, that's what we were propagating. We were looking to, to encourage that, um, but that's not to say, though, that 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 the um, the 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 links with the community uh, were were um, we we couldn't have had some integration. For I mean, just to reflect very quickly, uh, we had an instance where we had an NGO who was going out into the community and doing some great work in terms of community health workers, um, engaging in education, surveillance, screening, trying to improve the access and continue the. The engagement to the service, but they they congregate back, um, and the social distancing that they were doing at this facility when they congregated back at the hub was quite poor. So often it comes down to these these practicalities that that sometimes just one has to be on top of, but 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 aren't sometimes. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, in fact, uh, there's an, a follow-up question that's come through around um, how we mitigate against anxiety, fear, and stigmatization within communities, um, and how uh, I guess this is already around the how we actively engage people in communities um, through a primary healthcare approach. Um, uh, the, what are your thoughts necessarily around how we manage uh, these issues? Um, Affording Juliet, you want to take that? Yeah, or, okay. Uh, I, I can, uh, okay, I can come in there. Um, usually, fear and stigma comes through because of lack of knowledge. So, if 
someone doesn't know exactly what it takes to prevent yourself or protect yourself from contracting the COVID pandemic, uh, the, COVID, uh, the, the COVID infection, someone doesn't know, you know, the processes involved, you know, then the anxieties and the fears come in. I would give you an example of during the, um, uh, the HIV stigma and discrimination um, era, you'd see that people thought, oh, if we drink from the same cup, then I'll get the virus because they didn't know that they wouldn't get the virus through that. And for example, even in the community, even if someone has the virus, you know, by self isolation and when that someone is fine, is cleared that they no longer have the virus, they will not transmit any virus to the person. But in the communities right now, the, the stigma is still going on. People are being dis discriminated, uh, left, uh, like I was talking of the health service providers being discriminated. So I think the main reason is lack of knowledge. So the best solution to this is to focus at how do we raise awareness and educate the population, the public at large, to know these issues and uh, look at how they can get the virus, how they can prevent themselves from getting the virus if someone is infected, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that, uh, you know, education models like uh, health education or sensitization models would be the best solution to address um, uh, this, this concern, which is indeed there, it's happening right now. Um, thank you. And Denny, uh, I think we are, we've actually come to the end of our discussion. Do you have any, any uh, closing remarks, Richard, that you'd like to add to that? Well, I, I think, and, and perhaps just to pick up on Mwa's um, comment around the, um, the, the political agenda, um, you know, negative or positive has been asking the question, and that perhaps allows me to, to, just, to just speak in a closing remark around the, the, the issue of, of um, the importance of trust and collaboration that in a crisis pandemic that, that Juliet highlighted earlier, it, it's, that was a key input on, on her part. And I just like to second that in that really, it's not about, um, it's not about it being politicized. I think it's about the trust being built and whether it can be or not. And that's, that's on all sides. If you quite simply, if you're trusted, you then you're going to be part and parcel of the of the the the, the outcomes, part and parcel of engaging with uh, the the uh, the solutions and in devising those solutions. And I would hope that that's the way that we can we can move forward in a collective in a collective way. Um, corruption is an entirely different matter, and and that is a is a real concern. And we need a to um, but but from a from a um, a, from the different stakeholders' perspective, I just reiterate the importance of of uh, collaboration and trust, and listening to the to those that are on the ground, who uh, who uh, are are doing the work, who understand the challenges, and who can can help with all humility provide the solutions. Well, let me take this opportunity to thank you both for sharing your insights um, from your work and your experiences. Um, and I'd also just like to let those of those on the call know about next week's um, uh, presentation. We are, will be joined by uh, Dr. Joe Vieri and Dr. Tlaleng Mofo King, who will be talking around human rights issues um, in the face of COVID-19. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and thanks again, Richard and Juliet, for your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.